I've been in the sleep industry uh, for most of my life. Um, I've always found that people just take it for granted. It's not a performance criteria. Who cares about it, right? And I got really sort of disillusioned about that whole process. Um, I worked for a big company. My office was in Oldham, Manchester. I sort of had a bit of a midlife crisis, started talking to a local football club, seeing if they did anything about recovery and stuff like that. I won't mention the name of that, com that club. It just happened to be down the road. And while I was sort of in dialogue with them in all sorts of various ways, then suddenly I woke up one morning and read the papers in those days, and suddenly this club had got a sleep coach and looking after pampered footballers, tucking them in and reading them bedtime stories, no doubt. And so that's how I became a sleep coach in sports. Over the 22 years I've been in it, I work with all different athletes of all different age groups and genders across the globe and always been fascinated by a lot of the myths and misconceptions. There is no um, problem with the importance of sleep, but these things about eight hours a day and just getting it at night always fascinated me. So during my road through working with elite athletes, I've been able to cross some challenges of how can we deal with that problem? How could we improve that? How could we improve that? And it was just basically looking back at some of the things that we did uh, we, we've done before as past as human beings to imply that into the word sleep. So the first thing you want to do is forget the word sleep and let's think about mental and physical recovery periods. The second thing I want you to do is in this room there are chronotypes and chronotypes basically identify your sleep characteristic of whether you're a morning or a nighttime person. Those of you old enough like me will have heard the terms of like owls and larks. Right? Now this is a little genetic twist, it's not something you create. Now, if you're an am -er like me, you will wake up and always switch your alarm off. It never wakes you up. I'm always up, ready to go. I'm starving. I just want to get on with my day. If you're a pm -er, you like the evenings and nighttime. And if you lived about 30 minutes away from Sage, then you were still in bed this morning at 27 minutes past 8, hitting the snooze button, just trying to grab every single minute. So I want to think in this room, which chronotype would you be? I am not going to, to stick with some of the more conventional things around sleep because, as you can see from the title, it's unconventional. So one of the really important things as human beings is to understand the circadian rhythms of the day. So just tap it in your browser, take a look at some images, and get a better relationship with it because that process of the sun going around our planet and us as human beings with brains has not changed, but the world certainly has. Your relationship with that is quite key to recovery. Just a little bit of education. Um, up until the electric light bulb was invented, humans slept in a polyphasic way, and what that means is a multiphasic way, biphasic, triphasic, shorter periods more often. It was only when we invented electric light that we started to sleep monophasically, which is just at night. So it's kind of when you start looking with athletes and their schedules and everything else, you're trying to look at how you can get through the day. And it's certainly, I don't, I don't think I've ever met anybody who gets eight hours a day at night, 365 days of the year. Never mind when you look at the occupations and the 24-7 world we live in. So we certainly need to take a note there because we're moving further away from that natural circadian rhythm. The second one is daylight saving time. And that was when in certain countries we adopted Certain countries never have, certain countries adopted it and then went back to normal schedules. And also, in different parts of the world, you have different relationships with light and dark, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. So when you're looking at this whole relationship of how we get from A to B, these things can be really important. If you look at sleep in a slightly different way, this is an urgent need graph. You've got 48 hours there, so the black bit is night and the blue bit is day. And it's a bit like a mountain to climb. When the sun comes around and triggers you to wake, it's not that you're getting more awake as the day goes on. It's actually you're just getting closer and closer to your next opportunity to take sleep. And you'll see there there's a little moment which is around between one and three, which is the next human natural sleep period. Maybe a siesta in certain parts of the world. This is a moment when you should be going into some natural recovery period. 
if we hadn't invented light. There's another one around evening between five and seven, which is another place where you're actually designed to have some recovery like sleep. And this is this polyphasic approach. And when you look back to even the Victorians, they would go to sleep between 10 and 12 for a couple of hours, or be 12 and 2, and then be awake and go and see the neighbors. Uh, and all of these sort of things. And, and when we're working with like single-handed round-the-world sailors, there's lots of things that we have to do in a, what's the polyphasic manner. So this sort of approach needs to be taken on board. If you don't get it right, then you're completely out of sync in so many ways. And so there's a real relationship between light and dark. And all that really is, is rather than being in bright light or daylight, I'm just in diminished light, like just over there. Just operating throughout a day that I'd probably rather have a 12-hour exposure to light rather than this crazy shift which is about to happen at the end of this month when we go from 16 hours in the summer down to 8 and we go into the dark seasonal affective disorder month. The consequences of these things also bring you back to an addictive behavior and that is supplements and caffeine and energy drinks, uh, sleeping tablets, all of these types of things we start to do to try and get through the day, and they can become addictive, and it's quite serious uh, in, the, in the UK population and around the world as we're using these things just to try and get through it. What we tend to do is look at some very simple things. Some of the things I've been engaged in with professional cycling, for example, is these are seven little key recovery indicators. And if you just touch base with these seven areas, you can add those up to a much more greater aggregated overall gain in your overall approach to recovery. Some would say paradigm shift in your approach. There's two things there. One, the chronotype, but in cycles. If you're in a clinical environment tracking brainwave patterns, most academics will look at a 90-minute period and then benchmark that against another 90-minute period. And it's all the phases and stages of sleep. Now, five 90-minute cycles equals 7.5 hours. So I use that as a way to encourage somebody to stop thinking about sleeping in hours and sleeping in cycles. So 90-minute cycles and shorter 30-minute cycles or less during the course of the day. And the way you can all do this tonight, just grab a piece of paper and a pencil, get old school, constant wait time. That's the most important thing apart from this circadian rhythms in our world, is that you have your most consistent wait time. Now, mine can't be 8 o'clock because I'm an am -er. It's always got to be early. And if I've got a consistent wait time, then what I can do is chop my day up into 90-minute cycles, and it gives me some subconscious timings of when I can go to sleep, maybe at 11 or 9.30 or 12.30, 2 a.m. into 6.30. That's mine there, 6.30, constant wait time at the bottom. If I want to get up earlier, I go for 5 o'clock or 3.30. If I want a duvet day, I'll go back and do another cycle between 8 and 9.30. If I want to boost my cycle period, I'll go for something like 30 minutes, 20 minutes. And don't tell me you can't nap, because I can find the way you can nap it. I can sit right there in front of you all and do it, and you won't even know. You can take these little moments, and for an am -er, what's brilliant about this is when the summer comes along, I do not want to be going to bed at 9.30. So what I do is have a shorter period between 12.30 and 6.30, which is four cycles in six hours. I put a little 30-minute one early evening, right? And that means that I can join the evening. And most people get up in the morning, get through all the way until there's only so many hours left, and try to sleep. Your recovery program starts from the minute you wake up. And it's little moments every 90 minutes. So take the pressure off the nocturnal sleep and build it in a different way. So let's get back to school. Hands up if you're a PMer. Whoa. Hands up if you're an AMA. Whoa. Okay. Partners, offices, buildings, teams. If you spot that the coach is an AMA, strangely enough, everything is scheduled around an AMA's world. If there's a lot of PMs in the office, try and get them to do things differently. What you can do with this chronotype is really learn how to minimize the outside influences that are going to affect you, take advantage of your chronotype, and also be able to manage it better, because it will have an effect on you. It's a bit like being, uh, it's a simple graph this, but you know, things are all about communication. There's a 90-minute cycle between 11 and 12.30. Let's think of it as like 
going downstairs. At the bottom of the stairs is where the good restorative stuff, the REM deep sleep is. Now that means when you're down there is where you get the good stuff. It's only 20 to 25% of the time. So the problem is, is as you get to the point of going into sleep and you start wandering down the stairs, then it's tossing and turning. You're already just continuing digesting food, filling the bladder, thinking about things, partners, noises, and everything else. And there's a great danger you'll just go halfway down and go back up again, and then have another go. Because going down to the bottom is where you're in your most vulnerable state. So anything can trigger you out of it, and you might lose it. So you could spend many hours stuck in light sleep stages, and you don't get all the full benefits. You can if you're overtired, and have got really bad schedules, you'll get dumped at the bottom of the stairs. Now, I did work for a very serious manufacturer of bedding products and beds. And I always found this fascinating, is that when you wander around the world, we can sleep on anything, anywhere, anytime. I see people falling asleep in this conference room in front of me. I see people falling asleep on trains, planes, cars, sofas, everywhere. Right? So this whole relationship with what you sleep on is something I'd like to investigate with it. And you certainly can't coach professional mountaineers to take their big fat mattresses and their whole bedroom environments up at the side of a cliff. The one thing you're going to do is, and I'm going fast now, is one of the most ideal positions to sleep in is fetal. Right? And that is bent arms, our shoulders nicely folded with bent arms, right? We want a nice postural lines right the way through here, particularly because we're looking at devices all the time. So thinking mental and physical recovery. If I take that position in that fetal position, so you can see me, I'll go on the floor, hopefully you'll be able to see it. But if I adopt that position on the floor in a fetal position, you see this dirty great gap. Now I'm on my left side, because it's on the opposite side to my dominant side, the right. That means I can protect myself, which is good for the brain. There's that big gap where you put pillows. As soon as you start to move out of that position, because the pressure builds up with this nice orthopedic mattress, is I'm on the, take the pillow away, my head's twisted to one side and raised. So then I go to this position and push the pillow away again, still twisted and raised. I don't like that, so I'll go to my back. And I'll lie on my back, hunt for the pillow, shove it under my head, block off the airways, <laughs> start mouth breathing, and then I'll go back over here and grab the pillow. Now, all of that stuff is a complete waste of time, right? If this is just something, to give you an example, in there is a bed. That is a, an elite athlete sleep kit, and I just want to show you. I am a mesomorph profile, which I'm 183, about 80 kilograms, right? There is some little layers. There is no go faster mattress in here, right? But if I just get on that in a fetal position, where are you going to put that pillow? Beautifully aligned, everything's released underneath me. There's no place for a pillow, so it doesn't matter what position I get into, I'm always nicely balanced. And just like I said before, is if you want to go to the bottom of those stairs, you really need to think about ticking boxes. Now, the one thing that's always fascinated me is are we actually designed to sleep with other people? Because I don't know. If you sleep on your own, opposite side to your dominant side, you can sleep anywhere on a mattress, curled up, left side, right side. You have a single space as a children, single mattresses. And then when you get a regular sleeping partner, you end up in a double, which is only two foot three each, not three foot or 90 centimeters. Maybe a king size. That sounds good. That's only two foot six each. So you're actually sleeping together in less space than you had as a kid. It's not surprising that when you get a regular sleeping partner, is that you end up with this situation, it doesn't matter how madly in love you are, you will turn away from each other into your own little space. So if you're both right-handed, one of you is turning onto the wrong side. So, with your partners, maybe we haven't got to this particular point. We're tracking technology, we're doing lots of things. Be careful of tracking your sleep data. 
Because if you're not in a super king mattress, you're in too small a bed, that's going to affect how you sleep. If you've got a partner that's right-handed like you, one of you's on the wrong side. Right? If you're all of these little factors, if you don't know about circadian rhythms, if you don't know all about these factors, then really tracking your sleep is irrelevant. I don't know how much an elite athlete, I won't mention any names, but let's talk top elite athletes, how much REM sleep have they ever got in their lives? We don't know. How long have they slept for? We don't know, because we've never tracked it. So a lot of this information can be misguided. There's nothing wrong with it, but be careful. Get some of the basics right. I don't know when we've reached a point where I would be in the bar, find somebody attractive, go over and use the, do you come here often? Could I buy you a drink? And then I'd suddenly spot, hmm, they're left-handed. <laughs> I'm right-handed. A match. And then I go, do you like breakfast? And they go, yeah. And I go, oh. Because I want a pm -er. Because the mornings are for me. I want to get up. I want to smash everything in the house, and I'll give them a smoothie or a cup of tea. And then they start their day. In the evenings, they look after me. If you've got two emmers, nothing happens in the evening. If you've got two PMers, pain in the arse. So <laughs> I don't think we're going to get to that point where you actually choose a partner. But I tell you what, as life goes on, if you're not thinking about these things, then they start to have more of an impact, not only on your mental health and well-being, but your own personal performance and everything else that you do. So if you want to eat well, you want to exercise well, don't forget the third pillar, which has never been explored really that well, called sleep. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.